You're listening to The Blast by Beyond the Headlines. If you haven't heard episode one and two, go back now to listen and subscribe to Beyond the Headlines from The National. This episode includes accounts from people whose lives were changed forever on the 4th of August 2020, and it includes details some listeners may find upsetting. It's already been a long, hot day down at Beirut port, and the workers from the towering silos have unloaded a small mountain of grain to be stored away. Elias Nora was supervising the machines, unloading the grain from the hold of the ship moored beside the silos. His colleague, Hassan Hasruti, is in the control room, overseeing the operation. Around five o'clock, they take a break. Elias and two of the men are in his small office by the quayside, the loud clanging of the grain conveyors still whirring away in the background. He feels a shockwave under him, like something coming up from the water, he says. It startles him out of his chair and sends him outside to see what is happening. Thick smoke is rising from Warehouse 12, just 20 or 30 meters away from them. There isn't a dedicated fire service at the port and the blaze grows, spreading through the warehouse. The men have no idea what's in Warehouse 12, no idea that they're just meters away from a lethal concoction of dangerous goods. As the fire consumes each stash, the smoke billowing out of the windows changes color. It morphs from a thick gray to an almost white plume into a much darker black. A small crowd gathers to see what's afoot. Someone calls the fire brigade. While they wait for them, Elias calls his son Roman and tells him about the blaze. Firefighters are dispatched just before 6 p.m. They reach the port's eastern entrance and race down the service road towards the fire. Like the silo workers, the firefighters have no idea what's inside the heavy locked doors of Warehouse 12, but they do know immediately that something's wrong. The sound of the fire is like nothing they've ever heard. They call the command center. They need backup. At seven minutes past six, the northwestern corner of the warehouse explodes in a shower of sparks, perhaps caused by the horde of fireworks that start popping the stabs of light through the black column of smoke. And then it went faster and faster and faster until it got to a stage where it sounded like whoop, 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 like artillery shooting at an airplane. This whoop, 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 and whoosh, the first explosion happened. Windows, blown out by this first explosion, land all around him, and he says he jumps for cover, pulling his colleagues down with him. There's a man next to him, another facing them, and they hold tight. From afar, the fire already looks out of control. There's a thick tower of black grey smoke rising over the port, high into the blue summer sky. Hundreds of Beirutis come to their windows to see what's happening. Many pull out their phones and start recording. A roaring sound grows and grows, echoing through Beirut's neighborhoods. 35 seconds after the first explosion, at eight minutes past six, the ammonium nitrate detonates in a mushroom cloud. Those watching from afar can see the pressure wave ripping through buildings, shattering glass as it barrels outwards. They duck for cover, but there's no time to get out of the way. The black clouds of ash and smoke above the port turned orange-red, looking almost volcanic. I'm Finbar Anderson, and this is The Blast by Beyond the Headlines. Today's episode, Zero Hour. And whoosh, everything fell on us. We didn't hear a sound. For the big explosion, we heard no sound. Everything fell on us. There were blood and rocks everywhere. 
I was wounded. I couldn't see. It was like night. It was dark. I couldn't see anything. I closed my eyes, I waited, and slowly the light returned, and I saw my friend next to me covered with rocks. Elias was hurt but alive. So were his two colleagues. Just meters away from ground zero, they say the mountain of grain they had spent the afternoon unloading had saved their lives. Others have a different story. I was thrown to the ground instantly. My husband came running in from the bathroom and he was screaming. I just remember him screaming Isaac's name over and over again. Sarah Copland was one of those people drawn to her window by the sound of the first blast. She lived in Suso, a quiet Beirut neighborhood on a hill, just over a kilometer away from the port. She was in the middle of an ordinary evening. She had wrapped up her workday at the UN, was chatting with her husband, Craig, and feeding their two-year-old son, Isaac, his dinner. Sarah and her family hadn't been in Beirut long. She had taken a post there for the UN just a year earlier, and, despite some initial trepidation, had grown to love the place. Everybody welcomed us just so warmly. People were just so lovely to Isaac. You know, Lebanese love children, um, especially a little curly-haired boy like Isaac. Everywhere we went, people were trying to buy him ice cream and, um, you know, give him cuddles. He was just like a little rock star everywhere we went, and he loved that. When COVID hit, Sarah began working from home, which meant more time with Isaac in the evenings. They had a ritual. Nursery rhymes at dinner, a bath and a storybook before bed. Isaac was perched in his high chair, a few meters from the sliding glass doors of their balcony. He was singing along to Baby Shark when the blast erupted. His high chair had sort of shot across the room, um, so it wasn't at the same spot. And he was crying and we took him out of his chair and we weren't sure what it was at the time, like, you know, as everyone, no one knew what, what was happening. Um, so we weren't sure if the city was being bombed, if it was a terrorist attack or anything. Sarah, who was seven months pregnant at the time, worried there'd be another explosion. She figured the safest place to be, if there was one, was the bathroom. She wanted to get away from the windows, or at this point, the gaping holes where the windows had been. So I ran Isaac to the bathroom and, and my husband Craig came, came with us. And, but once we got to the bathroom, we saw that Isaac was really injured. A large shard of glass had hit bright-eyed, curly-haired Isaac right in the chest. I grabbed a towel and I wrapped him in it, trying to put pressure on his chest, which is where his injury was. And I just ran, I just ran out of the house. Um, I didn't have anything on me, no, you know, um, uh, wallet or keys or phone or anything. I just ran. And um, when we got downstairs, we could just see the complete devastation. Like there were people lying on the street covered in blood. There was um, just everything was just decimated. And I, remember, and I was just, I remember running out screaming, my baby, my baby, somebody help my baby. And this woman, she saw me and she, she literally screamed in horror. Because um, I didn't realize at the time I had like huge bits of glass in my face. And it's just, I always remember the look of this woman's face as she looked at us and like screamed in horror and she like covered her, her mouth. Sarah and her husband sprinted to the main road by their house. I just ran out into the middle of the road in, and waved down a car. And... Um, the guy who stopped, uh, he didn't speak any English or French. But he, you know, we just kept saying hospital, 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 and he led us in, in the car. And his wife and two young girls were in the car as well. And uh, he, he, just, uh, he just sped to the hospital. But as the car sped down the rubble-strewn street, Sarah realized they weren't headed in the direction of the closest hospital, St. George's. She started to panic. Then the driver passed another hospital. As he was driving, he passed that, you know, he passed the turn off. And so we were kind of screaming at him, you know, like, go back, go back, go back. Um, and then he kept on going. But he was like driving down the wrong side of the street, um, you know, at 100 k's an hour. Um, 
uh, like a madman. What Sarah didn't know then was that both of the hospitals they'd passed had been devastated in the blast. The emergency departments had turned into a maze of broken glass and mangled equipment. Physicians and nurses were scrambling to rescue their colleagues and the patients they'd been treating, and without most of the equipment they were used to. They were scarcely able to care for themselves, let alone the injured who began streaming in. I saw the scene at St. George's, and it will stay with me as long as I live. I, like Sarah, was trying to find a hospital. I was in the back seat of a car with a smashed windscreen, unable to walk, with multiple glass injuries to my neck, head, torso and knees. Two young women, terrified and panicked, drove me to try to find treatment. The first hospital we passed was completely destroyed, and bystanders shouted at us to keep moving. We kept driving through the rubble-strewn streets, the wheels crunching over glass and debris to St. George's. The scene there was worse. I had no phone, and like everyone else, no idea what was happening. I didn't know if I would find treatment, or if all the hospitals in the city were like this. I left the two women and asked someone to carry me to a corner of the hospital car park, where I waited with hundreds of others. We were all covered in blood and dazed, the full horror of what had happened slowly dawning on us. The hospital looked like it had been bombed from the inside out. The window frames gaped, dark and empty. There was no power. It was impossible to tell who was providing medical care who was already a patient at the hospital, and who had turned up seeking help. Everyone was dirty, covered in blood, and no one knew what was happening. Ambulances began arriving. Adding to the sense of chaos, they were not coming to drop off patients, but to take the most seriously injured away, to find treatment at other hospitals. Sarah didn't know any of this. All she knew was that her baby was slipping away from her. The driver swerved into the parking lot of the Rafiq Harir University Hospital. About five kilometers from the port, it was just far enough from the blast to have escaped the worst of the damage. And I think we were some of the first people injured in the explosion to turn up at Rafiq Harir because the guards out the front were telling us to go away. But we were so desperate. You know, Isaac, by the stage, um, had lost consciousness. Um, So we just pushed past them. And once we got inside and the doctor or the nurses saw um, that he was really injured, they took him straight away. And um, the last memory I have of him was being placed on this this bed in this this room in the emergency department. Um, And then because I was, I was, you know, heavily pregnant and quite, Uh, quite injured myself they put me in a wheelchair and wheeled me away and that was the last time I saw Isaac's injuries were too severe he died that evening one of nine children killed in the blast I have in my mind this idea of what had happened what would have happened if that gentleman hadn't taken us for a free career and instead we turned up at St George Isaac would have died in our arms and we would have always been, I mean, we probably be, would have been one, wandering around for, for hours with our child in our arms, dead. And we would have wondered for the rest of our lives whether if we just made it to the hospital, if he could have been saved. So I just think that there must be people who were like that, who went to hospitals that um, had been destroyed. And because of that, they have, they People either died or have, you know, permanent permanent disabilities when there could have been information, an alert going out saying these hospitals are, are destroyed. We're, you know, sending people to other other hospitals. But there were no public alert systems in place and no central hub for information. All across the city, people were scrambling for scraps of information about what had happened. 
and trying to find their loved ones. As Sarah was racing through the streets of Beirut, trying to get Isaac to the hospital, Rommel Nohra was desperately trying to call his father Elias at the port. Rommel knew the explosion must have had something to do with the fire Elias had told him about over the phone. We talked to Rommel at his father's home, his young daughter by his side. Uh, so I immediately thought that it must have been there, There's some, that there, there was something wrong. Uh, I tried to call him for like 15 minutes. It was the longest 15 minutes ever. <laughs> but finally, Rommel got through. Elias and two colleagues had survived, sheltered by the 800-ton mountain of grain. Elias emerged from the rubble to a scene of utter devastation. The ancient, noisy conveyor belt that he'd been loading grain onto earlier in the day was simply gone. One whole side of the silos had been blasted away, causing thousands of tons of grain to spill down towards the water. The operations room, where his colleagues, some of whom he'd known since the war, it had disappeared. Cars and hangars around the port had been stripped to bare metal skeletons, some still burning. And Warehouse 12, Warehouse 12 no longer existed. In its place, a vast crater that had already been filled by murky seawater. That long 15 minutes Rommel waited for news from his father was echoed thousands of times across the city. As terrified friends and family members frantically tried to contact loved ones. For some, the minutes dragged into interminable hours as they waited and waited, with no news. One of those waiting was Tatiana Hasruti. There was still no word from her father, Hassan, or anyone else in the operations room with him. The windows of their family home, in a Beirut suburb at the foot of the mountains just under four kilometers away from the port, had blown out in the explosion, letting in the warm evening air. All the glass was shattered all over the house. We had some things like they changed its places and uh, we didn't know what happened. Half an hour later, with their family home in ruins, and the skies around her darkening. Tatiana composed a desperate tweet. 6.44 p.m. My dad works in the port operations room. Till now, we don't know anything. His name is Hassan Hasruti. If you know someone there, someone told you they are fine, please let me know. I was a bit... Um shaky about posting it or not because you know it's not something to joke about if he's missing he's really missing and people are gonna search for him so when i told them i'm gonna put it it was like sure we don't know anything about him sure he is missing and we don't know what to do so they encouraged me to do that and i posted it first and then i started making threads about what he was wearing how he looks like about uh, the fake news we were getting that he is in this hospital or that hospital and we were going there and asking for him because people would say he, he is here and he's not there. Across the city, chaos and confusion took hold. René Ranem is a 27-year-old NGO worker who grew up in Beirut. She's lived through a war with neighbouring Israel and periods of instability in which car bombs were a weekly occurrence. But it all paled in comparison to this. No one knew what was going on. No one understood. Um, there was fears that the war had started, that we were being attacked. But I think we were still okay and in control. It was not until, at least for me, we started trying to contact people that the true anxiety for us kicked in. Because we, obviously, we didn't really suffer any major or any kind of uh, personal injuries, even the house, uh, some destruction, but nothing, nothing uh, considerable. Uh, but then starting to contact our friends, checking up on them, because we have a lot of friends that lived 
close to the port and in Beirut. Um, and we didn't quite understand the magnitude of what was going on and we couldn't reach everybody. And I think this is where the fear and anxiety started to accumulate. And just going on this, this rave and panic of trying to find different means to contact the people that we wanted to talk to. My colleague, Suniva Rose, walked the streets on the night of August 4th, surveying the damage and speaking to survivors. And I'm following someone who lives in the neighborhood and has left with her television set in her hand and her friends, uh, they took all their stuff and, and left. Um, I'm just going to see if she can say something to me. Can you just describe what happened, what you heard and what you're doing now? Uh, I was standing on the balcony uh, filming. Uh, there was like a fire on the Beirut port. They said it was uh, a firework uh, the container. And so I was filming that, then there was one explosion, and then another one, like a huge one. That one just uh, threw me inside. And the whole apartment is completely wrecked. The streets are full of people. I think a lot of people don't know where to go because all the houses are like, completely destroyed. There's a lot of injured. Apparently, there's a lot of dead people. And some people stranded the in buildings and stuff. So it's a, it's, a war, it's a war zone. As the hours wore on, the full scale of the destruction to the city became clear. There's a huge traffic jam because uh, there's so much destruction. You can see there's glass all over the floor. Um, right in front of me, I think there's uh, first aid. Uh, someone is being uh, transported by the by an ambulance away from the scene. Uh, I'm just gonna walk past. So this is someone who, an injured person in Jamese who's being uh, taken away on a stretcher. Uh, we're not very far from the place of the explosion in a neighborhood that's quite close to the port. And uh, it's a mix of residential apartments and, uh, and restaurants and shops. So uh, now I'm, I'm just moving along the street and you can see that there's a a house that completely collapsed. Those Beirutis that weren't seriously injured still faced a serious problem. Hundreds of thousands no longer had a home that they could go to. Made into refugees in their own city, they spent the rest of that long August night with family and friends on sofas and mattresses. As morning broke on a devastated city, those who had survived now turned their attention to the missing. Elias, whose legs were black with bruises and could barely walk, and his son Rommel, went down to the devastated port. Eight of their colleagues from the silos, including Hassan Hashruti, were still under the rubble. Elias and Rommel started taking shifts with other volunteers, combing the area around the silos, trying to find what was left of their friends and colleagues, and the missing fire crew. Saha Faris, a 27-year-old paramedic on the firefighter crew, was on the phone with her fiancé, telling him about the fire at the time of the explosion. Hers was one of the first bodies to be found. Instead of a white wedding dress, she was laid to rest in a white coffin carried by colleagues in the civil defense just two days after the blast. Over the coming days, the volunteer search teams, along with the Lebanese army and specialist rescue teams that flew in from around the world, started finding remains. But it became more and more clear that they were unlikely to find anyone else alive. They all died the moment of the explosion. Everyone that died there, they died the moment of the explosion. Lebanon's internal security forces have a list of 214 names of people who died in the port blast. But 
a local NGO called Man, which has reached out to the families of every single person who died, is still adding names to its list a whole year after the explosion. They've been able to verify 218 cases up until now. But Tatiana and her family clung to hope. My mom would say, we would not say he's dead until we get his body. Nevertheless, they knew time was running out for Hassan. And we know that somebody who is under the rubbles wouldn't live more than like four days, five days. So we would talk about that. We would say that he may not be alive yet. We know God can make miracles, but we also know that it's proven that he cannot like live very long there. It took 14 days to find Hassan's body, but the Hasrutis considered themselves fortunate compared to other victims' families. We got a full body with his clothes on, so this is like what uh, relieved us, you know, because some people did not get the chance to have their full body. So we gave him like the funeral he, he deserves. We heard in the last episode how the day before the explosion, Hassan had been at his village in the mountains with his wife, Ibtisam. He told her he regretted not having found a plot for his grave. Hassan never did get to choose his final resting place, but his family held his funeral in the church he had helped rebuild after the war. They laid him to rest in Wadi bin Ali, his hometown, near the river he swam in as a young man. Thank you to everyone who shared their stories. There's one more episode to come. The fallout, anger, what comes next, and a search for justice.